Hello. Uh, my name is Jason Litton. Uh, I'm a software developer at Tendril, which is here in Boulder. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about how we built our brand new shiny uh, production system with the heart of the free monad and, and the choices that we made, how we did it, why we did what we did. Um, start out to, to tell you a little bit about the motivations of this talk. Uh, I'm a day-to-day -day developer. I, I get paid to write code. I, I work through um, code. That's, that's my job. And I'm very practical about the code that I write. I don't do coding on the side. I, I don't. Uh, I read books sometimes, but I'm not. I'm not really. This isn't my life, right? I, I have other things that I like to do. Um, at work, I, I take coffee, and I take money, and an irrational hatred of all things living and dead, and compose those alchemy-like into code and tears. Uh, sometimes mine, sometimes others. Um, and when I, when I learn about category theory and I go to the talks about freeing everything, it just blows my head up. Uh, and, and I don't feel like a smart man, but it feels like there are signposts kind of out in the fog, right? These are the, the path that I'm going to take. But I want to find out the things that I can do tomorrow at work. What makes my everyday life better? What's the practicality? And so I want to talk to you today about practical applications of, of a free monad. It's a, a, a more advanced concept. Um, what is the free monad? I don't know. Like, I, I can't describe to you what the free monad is. As far as I'm concerned, it's magic. But that doesn't mean I can't use it. Okay? What I know is how to make the free monad go. And if I start with that at the heart, I can start building up the rest of the functional knowledge, not just for me, but for my entire team, for my entire organization. Um, so this is how a free monad goes. Uh, this is all going to be in Scala. That's the language that I work in. Um, the first thing that you need to do for the free monad is you need to know the steps that you're going to take. Okay? Those steps become types. Those are your verbs. The verbs are the heart of the contract that you're going to be implementing. Uh, this drives everything you do later. So this is the free monad verbs for every program ever written. Uh, you take some input, you validate it, you get some other stuff, you put it all together, validate it again, get some output. There's no program that doesn't do that, I don't think. Um, you, start, you have a trait of an action that's kind of a throwaway thing that you have to do. It's, it helps get you the free monad lift. And then up at the very top, uh, I'm doing a type alias. So we've got the action uh, natural transformation. We use Twitter futures at work. So finagle futures, I alias those out to Twitter futures. But I just call it an interpreter so that later when I use it, I can just call it interpreter. And it reads that way everywhere. Okay, and that just gives me a different name. Um, and now I just have things. And each of these things describes a thing that I need to do. It tells me my input and output. At this point, there's no input. There's no output, really. Okay, this, this program is not interesting and doesn't do very much. It's for the shape. Once you have those verbs, you can use the verbs. We're using cats here to lift into methods. So you have definitions that, that connect the, uh, a def with the action that you have here. So you've got typing on it and typing. So this is our input type. This is our output type. Uh, and it lifts everything into your free monad. So your definition connects to your verb. Then you can do your whole workflow as one single for comprehension. You compose it all together. And this is the program. This is everything the program does. And it is contractually obligated to do all of those things in that order every time, no matter how those things are done. Okay. Then, once you have that obligation, you make interpreters for the obligation. Okay. So things that actually implement the contract. Uh, our interpreter here is very simple. Noted extends interpreter, which is our type alias from before. So we've just buried all of that. Um, it needs an apply method. And it has to implement each of your verbs with the correct input and output type. Right? At this point, it's really not doing anything. I, 
I've never tried to run this. I just know it compiles. Um, and then at the end, there's one final magic step. You take your make it go method that we had before, and you fold map it with an interpreter. The way that we do it, we have a multi-tenant system. We have a hash map of IDs to interpreters, so it always picks the right one. If it's unimplemented, it throws an exception, we're done. We bail out. If you don't have types, it doesn't matter. If you're taking nothing and returning unit, you're not really doing anything. So it's actually pretty easy to wire types into this thing. Uh, in our verbs, we just put our types in the parentheses. You can put as much or as little in here as you want. And then your type of the action, that's your output type. Okay, so, so take input, it's going to take an int, it's going to return a string. Validate input, takes a string, returns a unit because it's just validating. Um, and then we change the lift. So the lift follows the same types. We've got our int here, that's our input. We've got our string here, that's our output. And uh, the lift, it goes to the string, and then there's our input so that we glue, we're gluing the verbs together with the definition. Okay. And then you adjust your for comp. So we've got our input up there at the top. So take input, takes an int, returns a string. We take a string, return unit, we take a string, we return, I think, a double at that point. Um, so now we've just wired it all together with our types. We can read it all the way through. Uh, the compiler knows all of the types for us. We don't have to play with it anymore. Then we uh, fix our interpreter, takes the type, returns the type. Okay? So each of these is, is going to be your actual work that's producing the actual thing that you want to do. Um, this is all um, uh, primitive types in the real world. We're not using primitive types, we're using complex types, but same, same idea applies. Okay? You're going to call to some function and get a thing back. Why does this work for us? Why did we cho choose the free monad as, as the core that, that we needed? Um, our business, if you've ever opened your mail and you've gotten a letter from your electric company, say, and it says you use this much electricity, you use this much last year, this is what it looks like over the last year, this is how you compare to your neighbors, that's the kind of thing we do. Okay? We have several large utility customers that all want things kind of the same, but a little different as well. Okay? They, we have a common data model in the back, so everything as it comes in gets transformed into a common data model, but our customers want to have different decisions. We want you to use this kind of data instead of that kind of data. We want you to throw away it when it's this and not that. But they're all a little different. Okay? So we need, um, we end up with, with a workflow that looks like this, what, I, what I'm calling the ball of commonality, which is the things that you have in common. Our inputs are always the same. The thing that triggers the process, it's always the same. It comes from an outside service. It is contractually obligated by that outside service. Our storage is always the same. It goes into one table in a database. It always has to look the same. In the middle, though, things get a little weird. Um, they want maybe a little bit different data. They want it longer. They want it shorter. They want this thing. They want that thing. And then why we throw away data and how we change it that's way different for, for customers. But in the end, they're all doing the same steps. They're just doing them a little differently. Okay. Our old system, um, that we replaced it with, um, does its choices about how to make these differences through XML which is the worst way to do that. You have to get strings exactly right or it fails out. There's no type checking. There's no compilation. You don't know if you've screwed anything up until after it's in production. That is not a good way to work. Um, it branches logic in the code based on tenant IDs and strings and things like that. Like There's if statements just everywhere. It is really difficult to comprehend. 
It's really difficult to work on, and it's, it, you can change something way over here, and it breaks something way over here. It is a legacy code base in all of the ways that legacy code bases exist. So it was our first thing. Every complex system comes from a simple system that works. So we, we took the lessons that we had on that and decided what we wanted to do differently. And what we wanted was that we wanted to limit choice. We wanted to limit what you could do in the system as a whole, in the workflow. Limit which steps you could take. But that workflow had to be very clear. You could just read it top to bottom. It's like six things, honestly. That's, that's what it does. And we wanted to have contracts that you had to adhere to. Right? This, is, this was one of the problems of doing all the workflow through XML. XML doesn't have any concept of contracts. Right? You can do anything you want in XML. So we wanted to have a tight sy uh, type system that holds everything to a contract. Um, and when you worked on different pieces of the system, it needed to be a low cognitive lift. Right? I don't have to go over here and remember this whole grand arc of things that might happen, because people can't do that. Like, people are really bad at remembering very large systems, especially if it's not well documented. Um, we wanted to have configuration instead of customization. So you can do these steps in this way. If you have a switch on, do it a little different. That's fine. Instead of do all of these things completely different for this one, and then all of these things completely different this way. It's very difficult to maintain. Uh, and we wanted to make our focus of our development, our work, on the things that are different instead of the things that are the same. Right? Let the same handle the same. Right? If, if I have two things that are happening the same, it's what code's for. It does the same thing the same way every time. Let code do what code does. So this is why we chose the free monad. Right? You see the, the, the interpretation before. Everything is locked into the same workflow. There is no way to change that without breaking everything. It won't even compile if you change that. Right? There's no customization for one group. Um, but the interpreter gets to make choices. Right? Which data do I fetch? How do I fetch it? How do I manipulate that data? But it does it in a segmented way. Right? One interpreter's choices don't affect the choices of another interpreter. I have two tenants that can operate slightly differently on the same set of workflow, on the same set of steps. And I can get what I want out of it. And I never have to change that central part. So I think this is why it, it started to work for us at the beginning. Um, we were already uh, using Scala. We, we have a microservices architecture. A lot of our HTTP stuff is done in Finagle. Right? So we were already using Twitter futures uh, idiomatically. We we're already familiar with the language. We knew how to work with uh, those futures. We knew the language of the futures. Uh, and we knew something about composition of them. We were doing four comps and things like that. Um, it also gave us a way that we have a single tenants interpreter. I can go look at that interpreter. All I see there is what's different instead of what's the same. It filters out all the noise, puts all the noise in the background, and I get the signal. I get the signal that I need. If I want to find out why tenant A do, or how tenant A does a certain thing, I can just open up their interpreter and I just see it. It's right there. There's like 50 lines that I have to look at instead of thousands. Um, and they're independent. I can change what one customer does without changing what another customer does. right? It, it reduces my bugs in production. It reduces crosstalk in my code because I can't possibly run this interpreter for that tenant. It doesn't happen. Um, it is also deterministic. Right? It is 
Uh, we're not purely functional because we are using REST. We're calling out to services. We have network stuff that we have to take care of. Some things fail sometimes. Um, but in isolation, the whole workflow is deterministic. It always happens the same way every time, no changes, no possible changes to it. I can't go in and recode that without a 3,000 line PR at this point. Um, that workflow, the controlling flow, that first four comp that we saw, that is testable by itself. You feed it a test interpreter and you know it does every step in order the right way every time. Okay, so that's, that was actually our first unit test that we wrote, was a fold map with a test interpreter so that we know all the data flows through the correct way if everything comes out correctly. Um, and then each new interpretation, you can test that interpreter with the confidence that the workflow is not the problem. Right? Your code can be in implementation, or your, your bugs can be in implementation of choices, but it's not the workflow. That's solid, and it's done, and it doesn't change. Um, and that, that makes it easy to do things the right way, and it makes it really hard to do things the wrong way, uh, which is something that you want to do in a, in, in a professional environment. Right? People, people will take the easy path. Right? We screw up because we take the easy path. Make it easier to do it right than to do it wrong, and it will get right. It'll get done right the first time. So these are the patterns that that made it easy for us to adopt this. For to, that made it easy for us to take this to production. And the first is the manager and worker pattern. Um, and this really gets into the composability of functional programming. You have some functions that are workers. They do a unit of work. They return one unit of thing. Okay? So we have a lot of workers that are REST clients. Call out to this one service in this one way, get my value back, and return the value. Might fail, so we wrap it all in futures. Um, then the managers our composition of those workers. Right? So, so do this one, do this one, do this one, do this one. And they don't do any other work. They don't make any of the decisions. All the decisions are made low or at the top. Right? So the low decisions are, did we throw an exception? Yes or no. That's really all the decisions we're making. At the top is, what do I do about any exceptions that I might have coming out of it? Um, we have a lot of layers of managers. So we have comp, uh, composition all the way through this thing uh, with very few actual workers. But all those workers are unit testable. Right? So, so our REST workers, we have mocks. We test past behavior, fail behavior, um, corner cases. And if we have that unit testing at the base level, and we're only composing those unit testing together, or we're composing those units together, we have confidence in the system as a whole. We know what happens at the bottom level with, with utmost confidence. And the composition doesn't really screw that up. Right? We, we have a solid system that is really well tested because we're because everything's a manager or it's a worker. And if your workers are tested, you're solid, you're gold. Um, this is the way that, that we do it with composition in Scala. So our workers are down here at the bottom. I have question mark implementations for them because they're, they don't really matter at this point. Um, each thing is going to just give me a future back. I'm going to get success or I'm going to get failure. Right? My manager says, do my first thing, do my second thing, do my third thing. I can read it top to bottom. I know exactly what it's doing. If any of these fail, whole thing fails out, future, failed future goes back, and it goes back up, and that manager doesn't care. It doesn't have to do any error handling at that point. We, we can do all that later. We push the side effects out to the side. That's, uh, we, we want it all on the edges as much as possible. <clears throat> And having the four comprehension as our basic workflow, 
having our futures, having manager and worker patterns led us to just compose everything, right? Just write composition for everything. Our managers are all four comprehensions. Are, um, that makes everything an early return. If we throw an exception, we bail out all the way up safely. Right? We don't have to be doing try-catch blocks anywhere else in the code except for the top. Um, and the really good thing about it with the idea of limited choice is that we're locked into a small number of monadic shapes. Okay? Uh, with the free monad, the four comprehension, uh, everything that you lift has to have the same monadic shape in the end. So we, we lift everything to Twitter futures at the end, so we have good or bad. That's all you can get out of it. Um, and it, it narrows the choices that we can make. We have some monad transformers. There's some other stuff in the bottom. But it all gets transformed into one shape. It is comprehensible. We know the language of the one thing. And that's all we have to do with it. Um, and then the, the other big composition is that when we're filtering our data, uh, we actually just use a list of functions. It has the same input types. It has the same output types. Uh, we use cats validated for our output types because it says valid or invalid. It's real easy to read. Um, and we have a fold comprehension over that list that returns early. It, it doesn't for comp because it's not right biased. So our, 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 we have composition of composition of composition of composition. You get a four comp, and 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 you get a four comp, and, four comp and every, bees, everywhere. Um, and so anywhere you open the code, except for the workers, you know the pattern. You can read it really easily. It's familiar, it's comfortable, and it's functional. Right? There's, there's not an imperative part about this. It is still a functional code base, but it is easy to pick up and easy to read. So the big thing that we did is we used the free monad as a command pattern. We have a language. We have all the verbs. We say, these are the commands you can do. And also, these are the commands that you have to do. You have to get data from here. You have to filter this kind of data. You have to transform into this shape. And you have to, to store it in our database. Um, and each, each takes the same kind of input. Well, not all of the verbs take the same kind of input. For each interpreter, you have to take the same kind of input, and you have to produce the same kind of output. And we're talking about complex types, and so we're going to have a case class that you take in, and there's a particular kind of case class you take out. Shapes are all the same. We don't have to check if you're this tenant, you have to check for this field. If you're this kind of tenant, you have to check for this field. Doesn't happen. All the fields are the same all the time. There's no way to break that. Um, and so that gives us a strongly typed definitive contract everywhere, all the way through the flow. Everyone has to do it. Everyone has to use the same types. Everyone has to do the same things. Everyone has to have the same steps all the time, every time. So, We've got the free monad. We have composition. That's not a production system. Right? Uh, if, if you're working as a developer, production systems are so much more. And it depends on what you optimize against. Right? Some, some systems are optimized against performance. Uh, our system, because of the legacy system, was optimized for maintainability. Right? That was our driving optimizing factor. We do optimize some for performance, right? But, but the big thing is, can we work on it? Can we use it? So we developed a set of guiding principles early in this. And, and these are guiding principles not just for this system, but for using functional programming in a mixed shop. Okay. The very first thing, the, the bedrock for our decisions was any of our developers should be able to work on this day one. Right? They don't need to learn what a free monad is. They don't need to learn really anything about Scala. 
they can crib the work that is there and write good functional code. We have people who are Java people. We have very few people who were originally Scala people. We have Python developers. And we need it so that any of those developers can get in, work on the code base without a lot of handholding. Um, so part of, so what we did there, uh, a rule that not everyone in functional is going to agree on, no symbols, right? No symbolic forms of functions. Uh, Scala Z has this thing that goes like that for its either, not that. Because you can't pronounce that when you read code, right? And if you have people who don't know Scala, who don't know FP, they get real turned off by that real fast, right? Uh, it, and so anything that is a symbolic form and there's no way around it, we type aliased, right? We, typed, we type aliased out the, the natural transformation to interpreter, right? I can, I can tell you what an interpreter is. I don't think I could still describe to you what a natural transformation from monadic type to action is. Um, the, the, sorry. Uh, settle early on the contract. So we decided the first thing that we did was what our verbs are, what our for comprehension are, what, what our workflow is, what our types are in and out. Since we did that a year ago, we have changed it one time because we had to extend the types that something takes to a list of that thing instead of that thing. That is the only change we have made on our workflow in, in the time that this has been in production. Uh, and the really important part, especially for new people coming in, just document the crap out of everything, right? So anything that is not intuitive out of the box has to be commented. We have a bunch of stuff in readmes about how it all works, how it fits together, how you work on this thing, what kinds of things you crib, what composition is, what a free monad is. Uh, everything, top to bottom, is documented. Uh, the, the really important part of the documentation is how to. How do I stand up a new thing without anyone telling me how? Because we wanted anyone to be able to work on it, you don't have to know category theory to write Scala. I don't think you even know, have to know category theory to write good functional code. You can do some really advanced stuff. You can do some really wild stuff if you know category theory. But you can still write good functional code without knowing deeply what category theory is. Okay? Um, the big choices that we made are our monad transformers, our lifts, all of the really, uh, our fold comprehension over validated. Um, that all lives in a syntax package. Right, so we have a package called syntax. It lives down there. Almost no one touches it. You, do, you can work on the whole system without ever opening that package. Um, everything in that package is super commented. Right? There, is, there is some symbolic stuff down there, honestly. <laughs> uh, and every symbol that we're using, why we're doing it, all commented in the code in case someone does need to go in and change it. Um, the next was agreement on style. Okay. Not just are we using points or non-points, but how do we write something that is both functional and readable? And what methods do we pick? What structures do we pick to make that happen? We use a lot from the standard library and just stick with the standard library. Um, but everything's composed, right? That we, we stick with composition so that, again, you can crib the work that's there and be writing functional code right away. Um, really important, intentionally, from day one, was that we were going to build a culture around the code. Okay? So in anthropology, there's a cycle between language and culture. Language builds culture and culture builds language. And the same thing happens in programming shops, right? The language you're using, the way you're expressing yourself builds the culture around it. And so from day one, 
We wanted to write good, clean, functional code, have other people write good, clean, functional code, and not have that be a stopping point, right? That's a starting point for a lot of things. Why does flat map work the way it does? Why do four comps work the way it, they do? It, it gives us a way to have people working on what they're doing and educate them about the theory later. Okay. Um, very important to us, as I said before, readability was vital, right? I, I think that one of the big turnoffs for a lot of people for functional programming is it's not terribly readable, right? You have to learn the names of things and how they go together, right? F dot G, I know that means compose those two together. I know how it works. Not readable on day one, right? Dot function call, I don't know. Um, and our documentation points to theoretical training. Okay, we have pointers to talks on the free monad. Kelly Robinson gave a great one that really inspired us that was uh, the fr why the free monad isn't free. Um, we've, we have that in our documentation. We have pointers to the red book where you go to learn more about Scala, about functional programming, if you want to know about it. So our next thing, so that we could have readability, does what it says on the box. Every function that we write, every type that we use, every alias that we create has a meaningful name. It is clear, it is meaningful, and so our code can read like an actual language. Okay? So I will say, go get this thing, or my error type is, I failed because of this. Right? Um, we're using those names not just in our code base. Right? We, we have a production system, so we're auditing all of our choices. All of our exceptions get saved by name in a database so that we can go and find out what went wrong. Why? They're all meaningful. They're all direct. Uh, any libraries that we chose had to be functional. We weren't choosing libraries that were uh, kind of Java-y, kind of Scala-y. Like they had to be functional libraries from the beginning. And they had to be opinionated libraries. Um, but they also had to be readable. Okay, so you had to know what was happening. We didn't choose Scala-Z for that reason is that there's a lot of symbolism in Scala Z, and it's hard for new developers to work on. Um, four comps are a recipe. They're a list of things to do. Since all, if we have good names on all of the methods we're calling, I can go look at a four comp and derive what it does without having to dig further down. Right? I can open my code at any level, have a pretty good idea of what's happening. Um, One really important thing that we kept biting ourselves on is that the step of gathering data has to be non-biased. You don't filter data at that point because you're using a multi-tenant system. Right? You have many different kinds of things going on. If I can get the data, get whatever data I can get. I don't care about the quality at that point. There's a step later that fixes that. Right? I might throw away the data for one tenant for one reason and another tenant for another reason, but I don't want to do that in the middle step. Right? Make it as generic as possible getting that out. Let all the choices come later. You can defer all of those decisions. Um, don't do it in the workers. Don't do it in your REST clients. Uh, that broke three times. <laughs> um, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, only use the, the monadic types that you need. Right? That, that we didn't want to expand out into ethers, into options, into tries, and have monad T's, and have ethers of futures and exceptions. and like It gets really out of control really fast. If you focus down to very few, you can learn the language of those few. You can use them very effectively. Start to expand a little. right? Um, but you don't have to do it at the front. Uh, we also settled very early on uh, the principle of least power. If you've not read this blog post, uh, I think it's a series of six blog posts uh, by Li Hao Yi. Uh, they are fantastic. 
it says use the least powerful form of what you're trying to do. Don't go overboard. There's no hey, watch this. Use the least powerful thing you can do to get the job done. When you do that, it really limits your choices. It limits the decisions. But it makes the code very clean. It makes it readable. It makes it comprehensible. Anywhere you open it up, you have the same kinds of things. Um, and one test format. We use flat spec uh, in, in Scala because it, it says, this thing should do this thing. And as you print it out on, on your tests, it tells you exactly what it's trying to do. It tells you why. It's very clear. Uh, you have all of the rules written in plain English. So we went through two iterations of this thing. It started growing, and then it shrank, um, which is a thing that a couple people have pointed out to me in Scala. As, as you learn to develop Scala, you, you get bigger, you get bigger, you get bigger, and then you l learn a form that helps you shrink it all back down. Right? That's, that's a very common thing that happens. So for our first pass, each tenant that we had had a full interpreter, had the whole apply, had everything that it did. Uh, we had re some reused codes down in, in REST layers, things like that. Uh, but adding a new tenant, we basically copy-pasted three or four files. We had an interpreter. We had some configuration, some stuff like that. And uh, that interpreter handled everything explicitly. But because of that ball of commonality, as, as we started looking at it, everything was pretty much the same. Right? The, we'd copy-paste, and we'd change maybe five lines. So we were about 90% the same. And so we had a lot of repeated code, um, which is not great. So because we were working in Scala, we used inheritance. Right? We, we have a base interpreter. Everything extends that base interpreter. New interpreters don't have to implement the apply method. That can live in the base. right? Your, your basic functions that you want to do live in the base. We narrowed it down to the parts that we were mutating most often, put those in definitions that were called by the base interpreter. So if you want to override it, you just override the one function. You override the one step. You don't have to do anything else. And so now, for our interpreters, most of our tenants, their whole interpreter is about 20 lines of code. And that includes imports. That includes spaces. Uh, the reason that it is that many lines of code and we have the, the inheritance is because as we audit things and as we do metrics, we have tenant names on them so that we can divide up who's going where. But in reality, all we're doing is setting up a logger and setting up our metric system in there for almost all of them. Um, and now we're at a point where we can stand up a new tenant in the whole thing one day, one person. Uh, as opposed to four engineers for about six months on the legacy system. So doing clean functional code has very clear business benefits. Right? It pays to do that. We can take those engineers. They can do other things. We can build a business. Uh, we can bring on new customers quick, super quick. And part of how we did this is we tried to hit Scala right in the sweet spot. Okay, so there are some people who dislike Scala because it's not functional enough. And there are some people who dislike Scala because it's not OO enough. Scala is not trying to be better Java. Scala is not trying to be worse Haskell. Right? Scala is trying to be Scala. And what we found for us in our industry, we have Java developers. Java is a huge language. We can take good things from OO, and we can take good things from FP. We can marry those together and get a lot of benefit out of it. So from FP, uh, the collection library in Scala is amazing. Uh, flat maps, folds, filters, filter not, all of that stuff makes it super easy to work with a collection 
no for loops anymore. Everything's done on one, two, three lines. Um, we have a monadic consistency. So we have all, everything in futures. We have everything in tries, options, things like that. For comps solve callback hell. Right? You don't call a future on return, call another future on return, and then your code's like way over here. It's, it's all in one list, and it exits early, and handles all the errors just the way you want it handled, and it's super, super readable. Um, and then we use type aliases for strings. We have a few things that are really genuinely arbitrary types, right? That, that in Java, you would just put a string on it, hope someone doesn't screw up and put in another string, delete the one you're looking for. It's all typed, it's all enforced by the compiler at that point, but we can treat it as a string when we need to treat it as a string. Um, and we can type alias away our symbolic types to get rid of the FUD that comes with going into a functional code base. Right? None of that is there. It sort of looks Java-y, but it's still pure Scala. Right? We, we still have the, the FP stuff. From OO, we're taking um, interoperability with other Java stuff that we have. We're, we've been in business for 15 years. We've got a lot of stuff in Java. It's been, my company's been around longer than Scala has been out there. Um, and then we use inheritance so that we're not repeating ourselves. Get rid of all the repetition with inheritance, with extension. Um, we don't have to type alias. We don't have to retype things. We just extend it, and we get all of the magic, override what we need. Um, and then the, the modularity of OO, so that we have this one type, goes into this one thing, we get the right thing out. You can do that same thing, pure Scala in, in FP. Um, I really think it, it works very cleanly in Scala to, to do it that way. The conclusion. So, to, to accomplish what, what we think we've accomplished, which is um, a nice clean code base, functional, in a mixed code place, using the free monad, uh, it worked very well for us because we had a multi-tenant and multi-format system. Okay, so, we needed things that produced the same sort of thing in the same sort of way, but not always. Um, we wanted to have a workflow that was the same for everyone. It's always the same, and it's comprehensible, and it's static. Uh, we had a little bit of differentiation in the details, right? The devil's in the details on this. Um, but we want everything to adhere to the same contract and force it by the compiler to adhere to the same contract. You can't break the system on its types. You can break it other ways, but not on types. Um, and we wanted composable tested units. Okay. So we have, we have like 87% code coverage in there, and it's all at the bottom layer. Manager and worker, we found was a really good way to think about it, really good way to think about composition why we're composing things and how we're composing things, how they're going together, um, and just compose everything, like everything composed. Uh, name things as clearly as you can. Name it intentionally. Choose to name things well, right? Uh, don't make your names throw away. Don't name anything X unless you don't really care what it is. How, uh, Lee howe has got a, a really good thing on naming as well. Uh, which I recommend. Uh, limit the monadic types you use and alias out the symbolism as much as you can. And that, that builds a really effective system for a mixed shop. And that's all I've got. So I will entertain questions, but thank you very much.